Good afternoon, everybody, and a welcome to all of you. My name is John Gravy, and I direct the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. We are so pleased to be partnering with the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education to be presenting a series of William W. Treat lectures this fall. Um, welcome to today's event, which celebrates Constitution Day. Uh, also known as Citizenship Day. Um, as many of you on the call um, probably know, Constitution Day commemorates the last day of the Constitutional Convention that was held in the summer um, of 1787. Uh, it, it commemorates in particular the day on which the document was signed and sent out to the states for ratification. Uh, according to legend, this is the day uh, when uh, Elizabeth Willing Powell, a highly civically engaged uh, resident of the city of, of Philadelphia, uh, asked Benjamin Franklin uh, whether the new document, the new constitution, created a republic or a monarchy. And Franklin uh, is said to have responded, a republic if you can keep it. Um, of course, uh, nine months later, uh, New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify the constitution on June 21st, 1788. Um, because Article 7 of the Constitution provided that it would go into effect upon ratification by nine states. Um, New Hampshire's ratification was the triggering event that put the Constitution uh, into, uh, into, um, into practice. Um, so today, um, we are going to start uh, our series of conversations about uh, what we should do to keep our republic. Uh, and at this point, I would like to introduce the executive director of the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, Martha Madsen, who will tell you a little bit more about today's event and introduce today's guests. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hold on just a second. Thank you very much, John. Um, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education envisions an informed, participatory, civil, and open-minded New Hampshire citizenry working toward the common good. We are very grateful to the Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service for their partnership um, in order to bring you this very timely discussion about the importance of civic education at this particular moment in history. This series of lectures, and there are more to come this fall and next year, they are made possible by a grant from the William W. Treat Foundation. Like Senator Warren Rudman, Judge Treat believed in the respectful exchange of ideas across party lines to advance the public good. He was an advocate for human rights, a diplomat, a New Hampshire probate judge, an author, and a banker. He served as a public delegate to the United Nations um, I'm sorry, the United National General Assembly, and we are honored to host these lectures in Judge Treat's memory and to continue his legacy. I'd like to thank also our constitutionally speaking partners who help us put this whole series together, New Hampshire Humanities, the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anson College, Citizens Count, and of course, the Rudman Center at the UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. I want to acknowledge also the work of teachers in this school year like no other. They are facing a disruptive and threatening time with compassion, creativity, and grit. I just got off a Zoom meeting with a number of MICFA Challenge teachers from all over New Hampshire. They talked about the challenges of technology and quarantine, but in spite of it, they're thrilled to be with their students and they're thrilled to be teaching um, and they're seeking um, to learn and to connect with, with their students. So thank you to all the social studies teachers out there who are guarding our democracy. Um, I also invite teachers to visit nhcivics.org to peruse our new curriculum library of resources. Some are remote friendly and they are created by New Hampshire teachers. So as John said, today is Constitution Day um, and what better way to celebrate than to discuss the importance of civics education to bolster the civic strength of our constitutional democracy. At this time of tension and polarization, our speakers have hopeful solutions, and I can't wait to hear what they have to share. 
I'd like to extend a warm New Hampshire welcome to our speakers tonight, national civic learning leaders, Louise DeBay and Ted McConnell. Louise DeBay is the executive director of iCivics, an organization founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. iCivics provides quality, nonpartisan, engaging civic education to more than 5 million students in all 50 states. Louise earned a law degree from McGill and an MBA from Yale. She has devoted her career to ensuring all students are prepared for active, thoughtful citizenship and life. Ted McConnell serves as Senior Policy Advisor to Civics Now, a coalition of 120 national organizations committed to improving civic learning in our nation's schools. New Hampshire Civics is proud to be one of those organizations. Ted also serves as the custodian of the Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools. A national leader for decades, Ted has directed the Campaign to Promote Civics Education, which is an initiative of the Center for Civic Education. He's co-coordinated the Congressional Conferences on Civic Education. He serves on numerous boards of directors from the McNeil Lehrer Production um, and Special Olympics to Rock the Vote. And in 2018, Ted was awarded the Isidore Starr Award for Excellence in Civics and Law Related Education from the American Bar Association. Um, before I turn the program over to Ted and Louise, please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'll interrupt the discussion midway and again at the end to ask our speakers to address your questions. On a personal note, I've learned a great deal from Ted and Louise over the years as I've listened to them in collaborative meetings and I'm always eager to read what they have to say. They've been my role models and I'm very grateful for their leadership um, for this essential cause at this really crucial time. They're truly giants in this movement and they offer me hope. Ted and Louise, we deeply appreciate your spending the Constitution, this Constitution Day with us in New Hampshire. So let's begin with Ted. Democracy needs to be reborn in each generation, and education is its midwife. So said the great 19th and 20th century education reformer John Dewey in a quote that I think neatly and succinctly describes today's conversation. Renewing our democracy through effective, student-centered civic learning. It's my great joy and honor to be here with my friend, the leader of our national effort to restore the civic mission of schools, to lead, who leads our Civics Now coalition of over 135 organizations dedicated to modernizing, improving, and reclaiming time and resources for civic education in every school in the nation. Louise and I thank our wonderful hosts, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education and the Warren B. Rudman Center at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, particularly the indispensable, the incredible, the so hardworking Martha Madsen of the New Hampshire Institute for Civics, who is New Hampshire's great resource for effective civic learning. It's a joy personally to be back virtually in New Hampshire. I used to be a visitor every other, every four years to New Hampshire until I completed a 12 step program to become a recovering political operative. Now, it's my privilege and pleasure to promote effective civic education programs like iCivics and policy work with the Civics Now Coalition. Louise, like me, you are no stranger to the great granite state. You're a neighbor from Massachusetts, and I understand you've made numerous visits to New Hampshire over the years, including a memorable one in 2014 with the founder of iCivics, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Louise, please tell us about that visit. <laughs> well, I don't know how you follow that, Ted. Um, you are, you are quite the showman. I'm, <laughs> I love you. Um, so thank you, Martha, uh, very much. And when you uh, wrote to us about the treat lectures, I recognized the name immediately because 
uh, in 2014. It was essentially my first assignment as the executive director of iCivics. I um, was at the time working with Justice O'Connor and we drove up to Concord and uh, I met her around lunchtime at the, um, at the hotel. And when I got there, she says to me, um, Justice Souter invited me to uh, go uh, to his house. And so I said, oh, well, all right. And they take off with the marshals and I start working. And, um, and then she shows back up 20 minutes later. And she says to me, it appears that he wanted me to look at his house, not in his house. So we had a great big laugh and uh, they remain very close friends. And uh, I understand actually that today is Justice Souter's birthday. And uh, Justice Souter has been such an amazing advocate for civic education over the years. We wish him a happy birthday and much health um, and peace to him. Um, so thank you. And we went on to have a wonderful time uh, with our hosts here uh, in New Hampshire. And I uh, have retained a very, very fond memories. You know, today is also the 133rd anniversary of the birth of Chief Justice Warren E. Berger, who chaired the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution, which started so many civic education programs and initiatives. We're meeting today in an unprecedented time of pandemic and a very consequential election with the backdrop of civil unrest over equity and access to the American dream. We also are meeting at a time when the majority of K-12 students in the country simply do not receive sufficient effective instruction in civics, American government, and history to equip and motivate them for informed, thoughtful participation as citizens and leaders of our Republic. Many factors over two generations have contributed to the decline in the time and attention and resources given to civics and history education in the majority of our schools. There is a palpable irony in this erosion given that this, one of the central reasons for the establishment of a system of public, free public education in our nation was to teach and prepare young people for citizenship. Louise, what do you think this moment says about American democracy from a civics perspective? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, I think it's really important for us to start um, at the George Floyd killing. I, I think that moment was absolutely horrifying for so many Americans. Uh, we had, for a moment there, we had a broad consensus that what we were seeing was unacceptable and horrifying and we needed solutions. We need uh, to address, this was just one event that was caught on the video, but there are so many other uh, events and the racism in our country is something that we really must address now. And people want solutions. They want action. They want something to happen, right? And then what happens is that we are so polarized. And immediately when the elephant pro uh, proposes a solution, the donkey kicks back and then the donkey proposes a solution and then the elephant hits the outrage button and we are not getting anywhere, right, in that way. So I think as you've said and, and, and many have said, this is a very, this is one of the most difficult moments we've faced as a country. And precisely at those moments is when we need our democratic norms. It is not easy to talk civilly to somebody you disagree with, right? And that is why you need those democratic norms. And that is where civics comes in. Civics is the muscle of democratic norms. And what we need to do is to teach that, to build that muscle through exercise as young people grow up, to build all of the skills, the knowledge, the disposition, the agency to have those democratic norms. And when times get really tough, when we really disagree, is exactly when it's gonna be hardest to exercise them, but also if you've gotten a quality civic education, hardest to give up. 
I was actually looking for an analogy for this and um, I um, looked at uh, the world of ethics. And I looked at a recent study actually from a professor I don't know anything about, but um, his name is Dr. Rosema uh, from Washington uh, law, uh, law School in Washington State. Um, and he did an interesting analysis about ethics laws. It sounds like it has nothing to do with it, but bear with me for a second. So lawyers, I'm a lawyer by training, and lawyers uh, in 48 out of 50 states have to take the MPRE exam. That's an exam you get trained for, and it's about ethical rules. Um, and, and you either pass it or you don't. States have different cutoff points. They require different uh, levels of uh, accomplishment or achievement to pass it. And what Dr. Rosima did is look at, is it true that are there fewer cases of misconduct amongst lawyer if you have passed with high grades uh, in uh, this exam, the MPRE exam? And the answer is yes. If you get trained and if you invest and if you know that everybody thinks it's really important, ethics are important, you are less likely to have a case of misconduct in the States. And there's a lot of data behind this. That is exactly the same as civics. In the case of civics, if adults take it seriously, and if everybody understands that democratic norms matter, we will see fewer episodes of uncivility and, and the abil greater ability to, to forge solutions. With that, I'm gonna tell you that I am not naive. We disagree profoundly. And in ca some cases, we disagree about values. These are very important things. But those disagreements have always been part of the tensions of the American experience. We're not, uh, we're never gonna have this kumbaya movement. What we will have is we have to live together. So what is the best way for us to live together? Best way for us to live together is to invest in our students and to invest in education and to build those democratic norms and exercise those muscles. As you alluded to, Louise, we're living in a time of intense political polarization, as you called it, Team Donkey, Team Elephant. Studies have found Americans are more fractured than any time since the Civil War. Ideological siloing and partisan antipathy shape so many aspects of all of our lives. Louise, what is civic education's role in bridging the great divides in our nation? So if you look um, right now, it would be really easy to be very cynical and very pessimistic. Uh, I, I'd say you'd find plenty of evidence for that. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna find evidence for optimism, which is a lot harder uh, to find. Um, but let me um, tell you some new research that we've just commissioned here at Civics Now, uh, where both uh, Ted and I um, work. So uh, the great Frank Luntz, a pollster, um, was incredibly kind to us and did a pro bono assignment. And uh, Frank uh, 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 polled in a, a representative sample of the American electorate by which I mean that it looked just about like the electoral map. He asked people what, we know the polarization, we know that our democracy is not in great shape, our constitutional democracy is not in great shape. What do you think are solutions? He gave them a set of solutions. A year of national service is one, less money in politics, another, easier access to voting, stricter regulations on social media, ranked choice voting, more participation in religious activities. Those were all some of the choices as well as civic education. But what was truly amazing to us was that civic education came out as the number one solution. That is Americans of all stripes, equally Republicans and Democrats, both thought that civic education was the best solution to what ails our democracy. We're about to publish the results uh, on Civics Now shortly. So you're getting a, um, an early view into this research, um, but we're really quite excited that um, Americans really believe in, in what we're doing. And, and I think we need to take action based on that. Okay, let's define what we're talking about here, Louise. What is civics in the 21st century context? The old 
I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm just a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill. That ain't going to cut it anymore. What is 21st century civics? Uh, maybe your version would actually cut <laughs> it. It's pretty good. I'm impressed. Um, so, indeed, I think that um, this moment called for uh, three things. Uh, it calls for more nuance and more depth. So it's great to know how a bill is put together, but if you don't understand the political forces, the use of power, how exactly, what we have laws for and so on and so forth, you're probably not gonna be fully equipped. You don't understand the history, you're not gonna be fully equipped to deal with this moment. So I think it calls for more depth, more rigor, more content actually. The second thing is, that it's pretty clear we are now in a digital democracy, right? This is not like it was before. Um, and uh, there are, you can say all you want that uh, kids are digital natives. They do not get born knowing what the Facebook algorithm is about. So w that needs to be taught. So a digital democracy, in, and you'll note that in Frank Luntz's um, polling, um, the, the electorate does not want regulations, or at least this sample did not want regulations on social media. What they wanted was that kids be taught about how to use it. How exactly do the algorithms work? How do you recognize what are the standards of journalism? And how can I consume media in a responsible manner without retweeting anything that I don't know about, right? And then the last thing I would say is more practice. Um, so Martha talked about McBuff Challenge just before. Um, we need to be in the real world trying to practice and exercise this muscle of civics that is debate, that is any kind of activity around writing letters to, to on public policy issues, researching them, uh, going on the real work, participating in policy issues. So those are all uh, three things that I think are a little bit different and a little bit uh, that need more attention than what we have had on civics in the past. It probably means we don't have enough time in the classroom and it probably means we need to take it more seriously. Amen. And the lunch data soon and a whole wealth of resources will be and are available at the Civics Now website, civicsnow.org. On the West Coast, that's civicsnow.org. Okay, what's the role of young people in this situation, Louise? Yeah, it's critical. Um, as some of uh, you might know, uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor is on the iCivic board. And she loves to say that adults have created an incredible mess uh, for students. Now that doesn't mean that what we're gonna do is just say, okay, bye-bye, you fix it, right? It actually means that adults have to take it seriously. That we have to take our own responsibility and actually educate students so that they have the skills, disposition, and agency to take up these policy challenges, which are significant. So I'll say that um, if you ask me about young people, probably I am not a young person. Uh, probably better uh, to ask them, right? So um, iCivics runs an equity in civics fellowship program. Um, our, the wonderful Amber coleman Mortley runs it. Uh, that program selects students from very diverse backgrounds across the country. We pay them a stipend and we train them uh, a lot in civic education so that we can listen to them. We can know what they think and so that they can communicate out about this subject as well. So actually the application is open right now. So if you have students who might be interested in this, please uh, send them our way. Uh, but I thought I might read to you uh, what some of the fellows from last year uh, said about civic education so that we heard directly from them. So uh, the first one is from Rachel Ronka from is an 11th grader from Boston Public Schools. Um, she said, I believe that government and social justice issues should have a greater presence in school curriculum, but I had never taken a civics class or heard of the term civic education. I found that many of my classmates were also uncertain about the meaning of civics. 
I think this reflects a larger deficiency in our education system when it comes to teaching students about what it means to be a contributing citizen. So I think we hear directly from a student saying, hey, I didn't get it. I, I, I didn't get any civics. So, and uh, I think it's really important. So that's really, that it's very validating for, for us to hear that. And then we have another uh, student, Marcus, uh, who said, everyone is not getting the same resources and that's a problem. We need to address it. It starts with a simple conversation and acknowledging it, right? So he's, Marcus is really focusing on the equity issues uh, between kids who are getting civics and kids who are not getting civics, who are getting more after school program and so on and so forth. So I, I'd say in general, um, the social issues and the tensions that our country is experiencing, um, young people are at the core of that. They are talking about it all the time. This is not something that we can keep from them. The school districts understand that they have to address these issues. And that is not going to happen in math class. It's not gonna happen in ELA class, in English class. The only place this will happen is in social studies class, in civics class, in government class. So we need to be prepared because that's where, that's where we're gonna build that muscle, that civics, that democratic norm muscle is in those classes. So that's why we think it's important and we're hearing it directly from students who say, I wanna participate. We know from 20 years of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, national tests on civics, that students can barely, barely display a 25% proficiency in this subject so vital to the future of our republic. More disturbingly, the results show there are substantial inequities in civic learning opportunities. The great Meyer Levinson at the Harvard School Graduate School of Education literally wrote a book on this subject called No Citizen Left Behind. Louise, how did we get here? Yeah, that would take a while <laughs> to explain. Did but you give us one reason? Many. Uh, so I think um, we've had decades and decades of education policy that have focused fairly narrowly on literacy, math and English literacy. Uh, a lot of testing, Common Core, NCLB, all of those things, right? Um, and then uh, we also have the impact of STEM education in 1957, when we had the Sputnik moment, our country realized that in order to defend its competitiveness, we needed to invest in STEM. So what did we do? We ended up spending quite a bit in education, quite a bit around in research. In education specifically, uh, in 2016, we spent $54 for every student, every year for STEM education. Compare that to the five cents per student per year that we spent in civic education. So that's, that's where our national priorities are right now. And I would posit that we are now to a point where we realize that the civic strength of our country is its competitiveness. That it is no longer enough to have financial resources or STEM uh, uh, competitiveness we need to be able to solve problems together, to resolve uh, the issues, to have a rule of law sustained in order to have greater competitiveness. So that's what we talk about in civic education. We talk about civic strength and building those bonds between people that will make us resilient as a community. And that is what we're talking about for civic education today. And that is what's going to guarantee that our country remains a competitive nation. Amen. My mother was very involved in national education reform work in the 1950s and 60s. She always said education policy is on a pendulum. It swings back and forth. Louise, how do we get it to swing back to high quality student-centered civic learning? What needs to be done? Well, um, I uh, wanted to tell you about a very specific project that we think is one of the cornerstones that needs to happen. So that's the Educating for American Democracy project. It is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the US Department of Education. 
it, it, ICEDIX is the grantee, but we have six co-PIs from uh, elite institutions uh, from Harvard, Jane Kamensky, Daniel Allen, uh, Tufts University, Peter Levine, Kay Kawashima Ginsburg, as well as uh, Paul Carice from ASU Scuttle School. Um, and uh, we have been uh, supported um, by 150 uh, national experts. And the point of this program is to integrate, to write a national guidance so that you can integrate the teaching of history and civics together for K-12. And that is um, one of the cornerstones. We need to reimagine civics and we need to reimagine in many different ways. This is a great place to start. So that, what that national guidance will do is to give um, a roadmap for state uh, uh, administrators, for state education chiefs, so that they can adjust their, their standards uh, to, be, um, to be integrated with history and civics, to ask deeper questions about why we have the history and civics that we have. It has to tell the stories to the students that they had not heard before. They might not have heard about Tulsa or Black Wall Street. They might not have heard about many stories of achievement um, and they need to hear them. And they also need to wrestle with the tension between the great achievements of our, the exceptional great achievements of our country, and also the very painful histories in our uh, country, uh, particularly around slavery. So, so that um, project is, um, has developed at its core design challenges. So design challenges reflect the fact that telling one common story or a uniting story, an e pluribus story, the e pluribus unum story about our history and civics is really, really hard to do. And so what we did is we highlighted some of the tensions that are inherent in the American experience and featured them rather than uh, made them a bug of the system. We want classrooms to wrestle with these ideas of American exceptionalism and, and, uh, and the great achievement as well as with very painful histories together. And that will look different across the country, right? We know that this country is made up of so many different experiences in so many different states. Martha Madsen, I know you want to bring in some questions from our wonderful audience, but I got to ask Louise a follow-up question here. We can't leave this hanging. What is this going to look like at the state level, Louise? Well, very specifically in uh, New Hampshire, actually, because we're here, I thought I would look at the uh, social study standards in New Hampshire. I know that um, the state is in the process of revising the standards, so the version I looked at was from 2006. And in that, um, there's a uh, standard I picked out uh, because it was very uh, representative. Uh, you would probably find the standard anywhere in the United States, uh, in, in any of the other states. So it says, explain the legislative and political processes by which a bill becomes a law or government policy is established at the local, state, and federal levels. So that standard is actually something that would also appear in the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap. This is not, um, this is very, very important, right? We're not saying that students shouldn't know how the system works. But Amer uh, the EAD roadmap would probably also ask, what is a law? Why do we have a law? What is federalism? What principles define it? What are its values? And then it might ask two other things. How do other societies develop laws, right? What are other ways to get there? And then the last one, um, which I think is very new. In a constitutional democracy, what are the roles of institutions and procedures? And what are the roles of virtues, values, and good citizenship? So in the American experiment, laws, policies, government, those are all very important, but so are social movements. And so is the strength of the community, right? And so we want to have a very full perspective and we want to ask deeper questions. And provide students with a deeper background so that they can have 
formulate their own thoughts and develop critical thinking about the situation as it is now and the past as well. Okay, Martha, would be happy to entertain some questions. The hard ones go to Louise, I take the softballs. Okay, I wanted to ask when those will be released. So the roadmap is uh, it's almost done, but um, it is in production now. We will release it at a convening uh, in February 2021, virtual convening, unfortunately, at this point, um, and we will disseminate it widely. Um, and in the interim, we are trying to build examples of it so that people can see educators, not only state administrators, but all the district administrators and educators can see what we're talking about and look at sample curriculum just to see uh, what it's like. And then we're trying to build an implementation roadmap because this is the first step of what mm -hmm. is going to be a very ambitious program. Thank you. Um, we have a, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Speak up a little. Okay. Um, we have a question from um, Stephen Masiata. How do we balance the need for content with the important elements of both inquiry and action? Teachers often struggle with this, believing that there is no time for all of it. So I, I think the um, simple answer to that is you put it together. So the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap is a set of questions. So there are thematic questions um, and guiding questions and driving questions. And what we wanna do, we've written a pedagogy guide to help teachers be able to teach this way and show them how to do it. But you need to start with that kind of framing of inquiry, but within the content. So to us, that's kind of at the core of what we believe. I think the American experiment in civics is just, uh, too nuanced and too complicated to have one answer. And one answer might work in one community, it might not work in another, right? So this is not, just to be clear, this is not curriculum. There is no one telling anyone what to do. There's simply guidance um, that, that, uh, from experts that hopefully will help um, states, districts, and teachers to teach in a more, um, in this way, sort of in an inquiry-based way. Thank you. Um, Another question from Charles White. A drag on the implementation of effective civic education doesn't come as much from teachers and students as from the school communities. The keep politics out of schools has long been a rationale for neutering civic education. I'm afraid that sentiment will only grow due to the toxic polit political environment today. Engaging students in public policy discussion and deliberation generates controversy controversy and community members are horrified, et cetera. How do we rally members of the community around civic education as a central remedy to civic dysfunction? And how do we convince them that productive and civil discourse will be impossible without allowing students to grapple with genuine controversy? So um, I'll start, Ted, and, and you might want to add to it. Um, so I hear both, right? So we, um, have uh, over 120,000 teachers every year on the iCivics platform. They talk to us a lot. Um, I do hear what, exactly what you're saying, that teachers are, some teachers I've heard uh, have uh, told us that they are being prevented from teaching the election. Um, that's um, terrible. <laughs> um, it, it, we, we cannot get to a point where we believe that voting in elections is a partisan issue. It is not. Um, so, so that's uh, one thing I hear. I also hear the optimism, right? I, I, I know I sound like Pollyanna, but I, I hear the optimism of we have gotten to a stage where nothing else will get us out of it, right? And so that parents increasingly find that to be uh, useful. Now, it's, it's not gonna look the same in every community, but I think the fundamental point you're making, Charles, is that uh, education policy is the result, not the driving force of popular sentiment. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's very important for us to work directly with communities, parents, and educators to be able for them to understand what we're talking about. That's why I'm here, right? Understand what we're talking about when we talk about civics and how it will have a benefit. Yes, there may be controversy along the way, but it's probably better that your students engage with each other and learn how to talk across differences in a classroom than starting yelling on Twitter uh, to, to somebody um, uh, later, so. 
Okay. I just want to say hi to my friend, Dr. White, and add in last year's poll by Phi Delta Kappa of American Attitudes on Education, 92% of Americans said teaching civics is most important in schools. Now, Martha, I got a big announcement I want to get to. So let's hold some questions for a little bit. Turn yep. the tables and Dr. DeBay, fire away. <laughs> So, Ted, this is not going to happen without support. The work hap that happens in schools, but what do the states and federal government have to do? Well, Louise, this Constitution Day is a landmark day for civic and history education. This morning, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut and Congressman Tom Cole of Oklahoma introduced the bipartisan Educating for Democracy Act of 2020 in the United States House of Representatives. This landmark bill, the most comprehensive federal legislation for civic and history education in the history of our republic, would authorize up to a billion dollars in new federal investments to states, school districts, nonprofits, higher education, and research entities on a competitive basis with a priority for underserved school populations, all designed to strengthen and improve and modernize civic and history education. This bill will be of tremendous help to the states and locals in improving civic education. And for those of you who follow Congress, yes, it will be reintroduced in January in the new Congress and Work is already underway on a Senate version. And uh, so that's fantastic news, Ted. Thank you so much. I know how hard you worked on this. So, so you. Uh, get, congratulations. And um, uh, it's been a, a, an immense effort and Ted's been at the core of it. So um, thank you. And um, let me ask you about states. What federal government is one level of government. What, what can states do? Well, the state, and the school district level are the critical levels we've got to reach and help do better. At Civics Now, we've developed a policy menu for state and local uh, policy makers and activists in the states, good people like our friend Martha Madsen, to use in working with their policy makers to strengthen and improve civic learning. I'm not going to go through the entire policy menu. It's available on the Civics Now website, but it covers everything soup to nuts, from standards to assessments to course and time requirements, the critical issue of teacher preparation and ongoing professional development, equity, uh, youth voice, school culture and leadership. Again, the policy menu is available at civicsnow.org and look under policy. I did see a question, um, Ted, that relates to this. Um, uh, the person is asking for great state models. So you want to address that? Oh, golly. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got a few great state models. Uh, for example, Florida passed the Sandra Day O'Connor Civic Learning Act which mandates a middle school civics class with assessment that is revolutionizing civics for middle school students in Florida. Illinois, which until a couple of years ago was one of 10 states in the nation where you didn't have to take a civics course to graduate high school, now requires it. And they went further. They have implemented a middle school, very, very innovative, interactive course, plus professional development for Illinois uh, students. Massachusetts, and Louise, you were at the heart of this, a year ago passed legislation that allows students to experience a civic project, to get their hands dirty in the art of democracy, a civic project that the students pick. There are many states, uh, and of course uh, there's funding being provided to implement this. There are many states that uh, are doing innovative work in civics, Arizona, California, Kansas, Washington State, have all improved their approach to civics through either legislation or administrative action. The Civics Now Coalition has a task force. It's working with 21 states and growing to replicate these successes. 
Thank you, uh, Ted. I, I will only add that um, when we talk about having a civic education that meets the moment, uh, this is still a, a discipline that is growing and innovating, right? So all of these models are very interesting. We continue to want innovation at the state and district level in terms of fashioning the kinds of models that would be, um, that would guarantee excellence, right? So excellence, we believe is a systemic issue. So uh, districts have to take this in the whole, um, throughout the district, both in, form, in classroom and informal learning. Somebody asked about that. These are all part of the same thing. The goal is to graduate students who are prepared and engaged in civic life. And you do that at every grade level. You don't start in middle school, you start early on. You don't start with uh, community service only later on, you start early on. You don't start engaging the community early on. You also have rigor in your content and you also have the skills and dispositions. Um, and somebody asked what we mean about disposition. Um, and I will say the ability to talk across differences, the character, the um, uh, somebody that you disagree with, you have to listen to. So those listening qualities, all of those things. So um, the skill, you'd be able to write a letter to your congressperson or to your state legislature. Uh, all of those things, they combine to make somebody you'd want to live next to, right, in, in your community. So. You know, Martin? Louise, we're building a new whole school approach, including district learning plans. Districts have to submit plans to the state on everything from school and gym, uh, from school nutrition to gym, why not include so, civic learning? It's much preferable to, than the dreaded paper pencil test form of accountability. So I said, we're building a whole new system approach to civic learning. Significant federal investment with publicly released data from the NAEP test so that state policymakers can judge how well they're doing. Improved state requirements with federal investment help like's been done in math, English, and STEM, including accountability and new tools like the EAD you're laboring to get completed by February. We focus at the state and district and school building level with increased investments, more accountability, and rewards for performance, increased attention to teacher preparation, and ongoing professional development, all leading to more engaging instruction and improved student attainment in this subject so critical to the future of our republic. Martha? Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a few more questions. Um, one is from Mark Newton. Just today, President Trump signed an executive order to establish a national commission to promote patriotic education. Um, he made the announcement about what he has dubbed the 1776 Commission at the first White House Conference on American History he said the commission will be aimed at establishing patriotic and pro-America education and will celebrate American history. And in his remarks, he criticized the 1619 Project, a New York Times project that explores slavery's legacy. I think it's more just wanting you to comment on that. I, no first of all, I've got to quibble with the notion this is the first White House conference on, on civics and history. Actually, our friend John Bridgeland held the first in 2003 during the presidency of George W. Bush. Uh, we encourage any policymakers increased attention to civic learning and history. And we hope that this 1776 project will reach out to those of us in the civics and history community so we can help them in their work. Um, you know, obviously, President Trump is in a campaign. Um, the, I think um, uh, the point of the EAD uh, exercise is to tell both sides of uh, our history. Um, and uh, I think that that kind of critical approach to our history, which has really an, an enormous amount of uh, achievement as part of it, is very important. 
but you need to dig deep. You need to have nuance and you need to have students who have, who are going to be able to handle all of the very complex problems that are coming at them. Thank you. Um, from Ad Adam Chuby, with an election coming up, how can we get young people involved in the process while also making sure to remain nonpartisan or bipartisan and not trying to indoctrinate young people to one side? Poll workers, poll workers, poll workers. The majority of poll workers in this country are my age with white hair and have no business working at the polls or at the election offices helping with mail-in and absentee ballots. We need to encourage, where it's allowed by state law, students to volunteer to be poll workers, for students to be given time off from either virtual or in-person schooling to attend the training. It's a wonderful way, and to work the polls, it's a wonderful way to help them develop their civic muscle and to get civically engaged. What else do you say, Louise? Well, I think Adam is a great teacher. Yes, he <laughs> we is. We know Adam hey, really Adam. well, so I, I think he knows how to teach the election. We, we have a great number of resources, so do a lot of other uh, organizations uh, to teach about the election. We think it's uh, absolutely critical. We have a couple games on that, obviously. Um, I, I think we have to encourage discussions about the issues in a um, controversial issues, right? I, I think it's very important to, to uh, note that a lot of schools, even though obviously um, the American system is very income based, um, there, there's not unanimity among students. It, sometimes you, we are very surprised about the diversity of views that there are in classrooms. I think we should encourage those discussions in a respectful manner. And for good election resources for the classroom, go to icivics.org or civicsrenewalnetwork.org, civicsrenewalnetwork.org or icivics.org. Okay, are you ready for another question? You bet. From Jim Schachter, how do you think about the informal learning space and civics versus what goes on in the classroom? I tried to address that a little bit before. Um, we think of it as one big package. So uh, in class plus informal, it makes one uh, package of uh, a graduate that is engaged and prepared for civic life. Uh, so it's like you learn and then you practice, right? And so that the exercise metaphor holds here as well. You have to have those opportunities. The, the, the issue we have is the inequities in the availability of those and the inequities in the outcomes of those. And so how seriously adults take those opportunities and how closely aligned and how much they pay attention to whether they're equally equitably uh, accessible is really, really important because some kids are not able to access those. E even if they're available, they won't be able to. And that's, um, you have to work a little harder uh, to be able to do that. But, but, but these are very important opportunities. Thank you. Um, from Michelle Herzog, that bill is fantastic. What, what can we do to get it passed? The Educating for Democracy Act of 2020. Contact your member of the United States House of Representatives. You can reach them by calling 202-224-3121-202-224-3121. Ask for your congressperson and ask them to support the Educating for Democracy Act introduced on Constitution Day by Congresswoman DeLauro and Congressman Cole. And then sign up at civicsnow.org for updates, civicsnow.org. Yeah, we've had a number of organizations sign up, so we're really thrilled at the response. So thank you to those who have signed up already. I think the show of force from the community, the civic education community is really important so that they see uh, that our membership is um, willing to work to get, to get this kind of legislation through. And the history community. Louise, a little bit ago, we were up to nearly 80 organizations, ranging from the American Bar Association to the Girl Scouts of America, who signed on to support the DeLauro Cole Bill. Okay, one last question about the Common Core. Um, Anne-Marie Banfield 
is concerned. Um, she says that the Common Core has not shown improvement in New Hampshire and our proficiency scores have gone down. I'm not sure what um, proficiency um, regarding what she's referring to, um, but perhaps in the area of social studies or Common Core, I'm not sure. Um, she said Civics Now integrates Common Core um, and she's wondering how they would go forward with the, with the recommendations given the data. Right. Respectfully, Civics Now does not incorporate Common Core. I think what she might be thinking is the formal name of Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts includes and the social studies. It was quite honestly, I'm gonna be political here for a minute, cover your ears, Louise, it was quite honestly a sop to the social studies community because the people behind Common Core were too chicken to address the potential controversies within the social studies sets. Now, a lot of people really like the social studies add on to Common Core, but here's the deal. You need to use the C3 civic framework, and then once it's released, the Education for American Democracy framework to help redo your state standards. And the EAD could frankly serve in those states that have them as the framework, the step between state standards and individual uh, instruction in the classroom. But use those two documents if, when your state standards come up for revision or push your state to redo their state standards to include them. Louise? Yeah, I mean, I think in fact it was a problem that Common Core did not include social studies because we got uh, sidelined uh, quite a bit in terms of time. You know, it's, it's pretty clear that schools are very achievement oriented, ever since NCLB, um, and scores student achievement oriented. And so um, as a result, social studies that was not as tested as frequently or, or seriously. Uh, really got um, the short shrift of it. Um, but in any event, um, I, I think uh, I, I'm just going to make one deeper point about um, reading achievement. Uh, it is uh, very much our belief that reading achievement will be increased if students read in the content area, right? So it, we're not in Common Core, but if you use um, primary sources, and texts that are re relevant uh, in nonfiction that build student knowledge, uh, reading achievement will increase, right? So um, in that way, if you want to do something to increase reading achievement, I think you want to just push on the social studies content. Absolutely. Instead of reading about Dick and Ch Jane chasing Spot, read about the life of Harriet Tubman. Read about the life of Benjamin Franklin. And that, an increased student-centered 21st century civic learning is how we're going to meet, as John Greeby quoted earlier, Dr. Franklin's charge to keep this republic. Thank you. There are some other um, questions, but our time is um, at an end, sadly. I could talk about this for hours. Um, but. Um, yeah, I, um, I can certainly um, send you the additional um, questions. Please do. We'll respond to them. Okay. Louise to the hard ones, me to the softballs. Okay. <laughs> so many, many thanks, Ted and Louise, for um, sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Um, Ted will be back again with us next week. He will be moderating a discussion between two career national security leaders uh, and it will be a discussion of the imperative of civic education to our national security. Um, we've also planned two additional treat webinars this fall. One is on the meaning of the oath of office and what, it, what that means um, with military judge Scott Stuckey and UNH law professor Maggie Goodlander. And the second will feature Michael Rebell, who is a Columbia professor and an attorney who is suing the state of Rhode Island for lack of civics education in their schools. Um, so please register for these events. Um, we look forward to having you come back with us again and continue this really important series of conversations. Um, so thank you so much everyone for being here and for our special guests.
Louise DeBay and Ted McConnell, thank you very much. And happy Constitution Day. Happy Constitution Day. Thank you so much. Good night.